Okay, welcome everybody uh, for the people, uh, for the camera. My name is uh, Rob Hordijk and I'm a synthesizer, designer and builder. And today we have a masterclass. Uh, it's all uh, people that have a system, so uh, we're going to go uh, really deep today. There's no limit to the technical and creative depths that we will go, so don't expect this to be a beginner's <coughs> story about synthesizers. Uh, actually, because it's a masterclass, it will mostly be questions and me trying to answer the questions. Uh, but first I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the process of, of, of designing and building uh, synthesizers and electronic music instruments. Uh, basically, it all starts with a, uh, with a concept. And uh, a concept is sort of like a general idea, but in the concept there are a couple of things that are uh, defined. Like, for instance, things that have to do with ergonomics. That means uh, how big will it be, how will it be used, uh, what is the comfortable way to use it, etc, etc, etc. And you have, you have to make a couple of choices there because when you're at the concept stage you can go anywhere, you can think like, oh I will build a, uh, a little synthesizer that is the size of a small matchbox, or I will build a synthesizer that is the size of a wall, uh, that's still at the conceptual level. But then you have to make some choices based on the fact that if you, have, uh, if you don't have a wall available, then maybe the matchbox is a better choice, or maybe some, somewhere in between, because that's probably playable. Uh, synthesizers, especially analog modular synthesizers, is um, it's a bit a, uh, a, a, a difficult uh, to define how far exactly it is an actual instrument, because if you look at the history of, of, of synthesizers, and we go back 50, 60 years, uh, then synthesizers were more like a, a studio. Uh, for instance, in the Netherlands there was a, a studio in the south of the Netherlands, uh, at the, the, the laboratories of Philips, and uh, it's a, a studio where in 1959 uh, Edgar Varese made a, a piece of electronic music, a poem Electronique, which is uh, quite well known in the electronic music world. And in those days, they basically uh, used all sorts of laboratory equipment and uh, that was set up in a studio and you could not really say that it was sort of like a instrument like a violin that you can pick up and play and, and move around, etc., etc. You know, if you wanted to move to another room, it would take days before you <laughs> would have moved and reconnected everything. And because it was a collection of separate devices, uh, yeah, what, what exactly is the instrument? So, at a conceptual level, you can freely think about uh, these things. And then you can say, well, I at least want to build something that is reasonably portable in a way that uh, it's easy to pick up and put in the back of your car and drive to a venue, uh, but uh, it's not that uh, you can sort of put it in your pocket because you also want to uh, play uh, the instrument and that means that it has to have a certain size to be uh, comfortable to play. And uh, so then after long thinking and investigating all sorts of materials that are available and, and you come up with a, with, a, with a concept. And that concept, for instance, defines uh, the size of the knobs, the distance of the knobs, the amount of knobs, the amount of connectors. And because that sort of gives you a limitation to the amount of functionality that you can build in and that also gives you a guideline where you can make decisions like this is more important than another thing so this really needs to be there 
well, I can st skip this because if I don't skip it, it becomes too big or uh, unplayable or something. <coughs> so, once you have your concept in your mind, and preferably written down on paper, but many designers have the concepts only in their mind, unless they have to write an article for a magazine where they finally have to write it down. And when they're writing down and reading it, saying like, oh, no, I understand what I've been doing. <laughs> uh, so then comes the second level, and the second level is basically what, what, what is called the functional design. And at the level of the functional design, things become already a little bit more technical. And uh, because you, you basically define which kind of functions do you want. Uh, if you make a, a synthesizer, you would like to have functions that, 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 that produce sound, that produce pitches. Uh, you have to have uh, devices that control these sounds and pitches. Uh, you can have devices that uh, or parts of the system that, that process sounds, etc, etc, etc. And in the functional design, basically, you put them all down and that, at the end, it will tell you, oh, we will have three oscillators, we will have uh, one filter, we will have two amp -lock generators, uh, six VCAs, uh, something like that. So basically, then you have a whole list of exactly what's going to be in the box, and then you see if you can fit it in the uh, size that was basically uh, uh, defined in the conceptual uh, design. So it's a lot of fitting things. And uh, so after the functional design comes a uh, a very interesting uh, process because then comes the process of the actual implementation and uh, that process also has two layers and uh, that is very crucial and interesting for electronic music devices the first layer is basically the algorithmic layer and I'll explain later exactly why that is important and what it is and then the second layer is the implementations of the algorithms. Uh, so, why algorithms? Well, algorithms are basically uh, little recipes that tell you how to solve a certain problem. Uh, very often it is associated with mathematics, uh, but an algorithm is not a mathematical formula. Because a mathematical formula is something that is sort of uh, in itself uh, something uh, like axis uh, to y point. Uh, but, but an algorithm is, uh, is basically a, a sort of like, uh, like a, a recipe for a meal. It gives you a certain steps that you have to do in a certain order to solve a problem. And, uh, this morning I had this idea of, of explaining an algorithm in the following way. Uh, just imagine that uh, we have a room and we have a door and we have outside the room and uh, a person is standing outside of the room. Then uh, you can, for the person to enter the room, you can make an algorithm that says uh, First look if the door is open or closed. If the door is open, take a couple of steps. So you're in the room, turn around 180 degrees and close the door. And uh, this algorithm basically will describe always, in every case, exactly what you have to do, what is needed to enter a room. Uh, and it will apply to every person. But the interesting thing about the algorithm is that the order of things is very important. If you mess up the order, like for instance you say, uh, take a couple of steps forward into the room as the first. And then you say, check if the door was open or closed. Well, if the door was open, no problem, <laughs> you know. But if the door was closed, <laughs> 
doesn't work. So the interesting thing about an algorithm is that an algorithm is a description to solve a problem, but with a description you can already prove if it will work or not work. And it is made, set up in a way, it is the, the, the algorithm is, is changed until actually in every circumstances you can prove that it will work. Now, why algorithms? And that is because if we are working with, with, with sound, then uh, we have to sort of realize what we are actually working with. And that's very important. And these days, uh, many people are uh, used to uh, work with uh, sound files on the computer. And then if you look at the sound file, you see that you have a number of dots and these, num and these dots, they all uh, together describe the sound, the sound recording. And every dot is basically one value in memory. And the computer can do a calculation on that value. And that gives the idea that sound is basically sort of like a two-dimensional process. Because you can see it on a two-dimensional computer screen. And, uh, and that it is about numbers about values. Uh, and that is an incorrect view because sound is not about numbers of values, sound is actually about waves. And waves are things that happen over a certain span of time. So you never look at individual numbers, you only look at what happens over a certain span of time and you will see waveforms and it is the properties of the waveforms that is what you're dealing with. So how you process these waveforms if you do it in an analog way or if you do it in a digital way doesn't really matter. It's about waves and it's not about numbers. And you can process these waves in, in several ways. You can also do it in mechanical with mechanical stuff. So uh, then uh, often I, I, I tell this, uh, this uh, thing that uh, at the beginning of the, the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 60s of the last century uh, there were the machines that were called analog computers. And analog computers were very quickly replaced by digital computers for a specific reason. But analog computers actually existed. If you google analog computer then you will find pictures of devices that look very much like modular synthesizers. <laughs> because originally the idea uh, when the synthesizers came about was actually to use analog computing to do processings on waveforms to basically program algorithms that would process waveforms so you could work with the sound. Uh, and that is still the same. So it doesn't really matter if you use an analog computer or a digital computer. It works the same way because it's all about the algorithms. And because you can implement an algorithm in both an analog or a digital way, if the algorithm is good, then you just go and see what is the best way to implement it. And then there is a couple of choices. Like, for instance, uh, some designers would go for the cheapest way and others would go for the best sound quality way. Uh, and so there's a, a couple of choices. It also means that if you design a synthesizer, you most probably end up with a device that's partly digital and partly analog. Because it doesn't have to be fully analog, it doesn't have to be fully digital. It can be a mix, which we call a hybrid system. And that is mostly the best way to go, because then you can pick the best way to solve the, implement the algorithms, sometimes in an analog way and sometimes in a digital way. Then I'm pretty sure that some people now think, uh, why not all digital? Well, both analog and digital also have their pitfalls. It's not that one is more perfect than the other. 
one might be more suitable for a certain task than the other and vice versa. So if you are into this kind of thing, you have to know all this and you have to do a lot of experimentation and you have to read a lot and you have to think a lot and, and it's quite interesting because as a designer you're always on a, on a line that at one side is, is art and at the other side is science. But that's also really nice to be a designer because if you're an artist you always have to be at the art side. You know, if you're a scientist, you always have to be at the science side. But if you're a designer, you can freely move backwards and forwards between the two and you pick a bit of the art side and you pick a bit of the science side and you combine it together and then you come up with something that preferably everybody is very happy with because we're in the business of making people happy. So, now, I don't think it's, a, it's a, at this point a, a good idea to go really deep into this sort of uh, analog digital uh, discussion because actually if you know exactly why, what, why, what it, this is about it is a pretty boring discussion. You just, uh, when you're designing the stuff and only for design it's, it's really interesting because they have the responsibility to make the thing sound good. Uh, so for a designer it's just like, okay, I have to implement this algorithm. Oh, if I do it in an analog way, I will have these and this and this issues. If I do it in a digital way, I will have this and this and this issues. What is the best choice? And sometimes it's this and sometimes it's another. But we will go back to waveforms. Uh, I have uh, put a little machine here, which is called an oscilloscope, because on an oscilloscope we can actually make the waveforms visible, and it's uh, always funny to, uh, to use that. So, the most simple waveform that we have is a uh, so-called uh, sine wave. sensitive to every pitch. Uh, that's one thing. But another thing is that uh, when these uh, waveforms travel through this space, there's reflections and uh, when, they, they, when the waveform is reflected, it meets the waveform that comes out of the speaker and there's a little time delay and then we get something that we call knots meaning that in, at certain moments uh, those two waveforms, the waveform that comes from the speaker and the wave that is reflected, sort of enhance each other, so they add to each other, and sometimes they actually, because of the timing difference, they come in, in antiphase and they cancel each other, and it appears like it uh, is much softer or sometimes even totally disappears. So, when you... Uh, and also the speaker boxes have a sort of uh, not very flat response, but they are supposed to be perfect. So let's assume that the speakers are perfect.
then you will ne still never in a room hear every pitch at the same level, at the same amplitude. And uh, even if the room is, 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 is completely treated, then still the ear, the mind, will sort of mess up. Which always is, 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 is a bit tricky, because uh, sometimes uh, you make a recording and then uh, later when you listen to the recording again in another place, you hear something that you were sure was not there when you recorded it. Well, maybe it was, because you never know. So, as long as you're sort of aware of all these things, you know, then, uh, but, but that's basically if you do a lot of, of mixing in a studio or, or if you do sound in a, in a, in a, in a big uh, hall or things, you know, then, then these things are important. But they tell us something about waves, and that is that uh, when you look at a wave, if you see, if you just consider a wave to be uh, sort of energy, at a, with a certain energy level, then there's also the negative energy. And that if you mix two waveforms, like two of these, these very uh, basic sine waves, then uh, you don't really know uh, what the result will be because uh, it is uh, uh, depending on basically the phase relationships between the two waveforms that uh, define what you hear. And I can uh, demonstrate this uh, very easily because uh, Because if I uh, add another sine wave to this wave, See that if you mix the two waves, at certain moments they enhance each other and at certain moments they cancel out each other, which is quite mysterious because it, when they cancel out they really disappear into nothingness. So you have two things and you have nothing. <laughs> okay. And you can really hear that it is actually two pictures. Now, the interesting thing is that if you have sine waves, because a sine wave is the most simple kind of waveform there is, it is it is based on the rotation of a wheel. If you have a wheel, like a bicycle wheel, and that wheel rotates, and you make a little LED light on the wheel, and you make it rotate, then basically the horizontal movement, if you will sort of graph that in time, will become a sine wave, and it's the most simple waveform. But, that is also interesting, because if you have this wheel, this bicycle wheel, with a little light, and if this wheel is turning this way, and the wheel is also sort of moving towards you, or away from you, then basically, you will create a spiral. The light will create a spiral. Now, and a spiral is a three-dimensional form. Uh, and one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that sound, the sound that you actually hear, is always in a space. So that means that it is in a three-dimensional space, so sound is a three-dimensional phenomenon. 
So the waveforms, they are actually three-dimensional. Normally they would sort of start from one point and spread out like a globe around that point. But they can also travel in a certain direction and waveforms can have several kind of forms. Uh, but the interesting thing is that if you look like a, a spiral waveform, uh, which does not happen to sound in space, but as a waveform it's an interesting thing, is that you, you actually uh, can graph that with a sine wave, but then if you graph the other, the third dimension at the same time, it will produce a waveform with the same format, same looks, but it will be shifted in time exactly by a quarter of the wavelength and that means that that is a cosine wave and all sound synthesis well, no, let me say it like this that, that sound synthesis becomes really interesting when you take uh, when you work with both sine components and cosine components because if you mix a sine and a cosine wave you actually get a the same form again, but it will be phase shifted halfway in between those two, uh, the, the sine and the cosine. So that means that if you work with sines and cosines, you can actually move a sound forward and backward in time, which is basically called uh, phase modulation, but very often it's also called frequency modulation. And uh, there is uh, several interesting things that you can do with, uh, with, uh, when you work with both the sines and cosines. For instance, normally a sound consists of a lot of these sine waves with lots of different pitches. And they sort of melt together into one sound. And if you want to know which, sound, which sine waves are in that sound, so to analyze it, there is a, uh, a mathematical uh, algorithm and it's called the Fourier analysis and if you apply Fourier analysis to a sound file it will actually tell you which sine waves and of which pitches are present in the sound and uh, I remember that uh, in the early 80s when, uh, when computers became available to uh, people like me and some other people uh, Fourier analysis was sort of like uh, well the hot thing, and uh, and it sounded like well something really new and modern, and uh, then I uh, I thought who is this guy Fourier and I looked it up and it turned out that the, this guy Fourier actually thought about this 200 years ago. It was it was it was it was in Napoleonic times. He was a mathematician who worked for the Napoleon army. He had to calculate how much gunpowder you had to put in a, in, a, in, a, in a gun and how to aim it to make the, the cannonball land on the head of the general of the other side. And of course he only had to do that uh, once in a couple of weeks and all the rest of the time he was in his tent doing nothing and he came up with Fourier analysis. <laughs> and, uh, and at that time, and Fourier analysis really tells you everything about sound. But at that time it wasn't even known that sound consisted of the sine wave particles or harmonics or partials as they are uh, basically called. Because that was only 50 years later when a, there was a certain Mr. Helmholtz who actually proved that sound consists of little particles and the particles together are added and create the timbre of a sound. And uh, for the guys uh, in the Netherlands, if you go to uh, Tyler's Museum in uh, Haarlem, have you been in Tyler's Museum? You have to go to Tyler's Museum, first of all, because you will find the first synthesizer there. That is the machine that Helmholtz used to prove that if you add sounds of different uh, related frequencies, they will melt into one sound. But you will also see there the original uh, Helmholtz resonators from 1850 that he used to prove that um, uh, you can take away one particle sound, one partial from a sound, if you have a resonator that resonates on that partial, 
And then if you do that, what he did, he measured the temperature of the, 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 the bowl and the temperature would increase, so the, the, the sound would disappear, or the, 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 that sine wave would disappear from the sound, and when that happened, the resonator would get warmer. So basically he proved that it was energy, that it was kinetic energy, and that it was transformed into warmth, as most of the times happens when kinetic energy is transformed, like if you have a break, that gets warm. And uh, it's there on display. So, uh, and it's beautiful because it's uh, these old brass uh, bowls with a little pin around it and there's a whole contraption with several of them and there's this, this sort of, uh, and, and, and when he did it in the reversed way, it's sort of like a little, looks a little bit like an organ and it, it has, I think, eight keys, like, like a little eight key keyboard, but it's a scientific experiment. And actually, because it, it really, with, with this device, it's able to sort of create different tempers, it probably qualifies as the first synthesizer. I, I think so. I like to think so, at least. <laughs> so, uh, these are very important things, because uh, if, we, if we sort of use this, this, this idea of, of two or more waveforms that are mixed together, then it all starts to become uh, more, uh, more organic, it starts to move. Uh, so like, like, if we have only one, it's, it's static. And the interesting thing is, of course, that if we start to add harmonics, sound becomes much more rich and lively and, and, and so uh, basically the, 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 when, when two waveforms interact they, they call it beating the moment when you work with beating you start to create something that starts to move and loses its, its uh, uh, static character uh, I think that this is basically the sort of introduction that uh, uh, is already uh, quite uh, mind-boggling for some people, so I think we will stop this now, and we take a little break, a uh, ten-minute break, have some coffee, a cookie, and a cigarette for me, and then uh, <laughs> we go back, and then we're going to get much more into things, and uh, maybe I can, uh, maybe it's good to, if someone has a question that somebody puts the question and then I will try to see if we can make a patch that works with that question. Okay?